Hey, you guys, guys are bums, and welcome back to A Few Bad Men. Today, we have episode three of Dutch Schultz. All right, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're getting a YouTube friendly version. All right, if you want the unadulterated version with all the graphic images that I can't show you on YouTube, you got to subscribe to the A Few Bad Men Patreon channel. There, you get all the uncut versions, and you get them a few days early than what I can put them up on YouTube because YouTube has to check all of my videos like. It's customs or something. All right, so without further ado, let's get into this. When we left off, the Dutchman was being placed into the ambulance. In the ambulance, Dutch reached into his pocket and gave his wad of cash to the attendant, saying, better you have it than the government. Take care of me, buddy. The attendant would later turn the $725 over to the police. Dutch's gold watch and sapphire ring were also confiscated. At the hospital, Berman, Rosencrantz, and Landau refused to admit that they worked for the Dutch. Dutch told the cops, don't waste your breath. They'll never talk. They're with me. Rosencrantz, despite being in pain, fought the police when they tried to fingerprint him, balling up his fists each time, making it impossible. He yelled, get the hell away from me. Go out and get me an ice cream soda. Abe Landau, who had been with Dutch the longest, was his personal bodyguard, and he gave his name as Frank Leo. A detective asked Dutch again, who shot him? And again, he said, I don't know. Then Dutch asked for a priest. Even though he was Jewish, Dutch had converted to Catholicism and become close to a Father McElerney while he spent a few weeks in the cell refusing to testify against one of his workers back in 1932. A prohibition agent was shot and killed during a raid in one of Dutch's breweries. Now he wanted McElerney by his side. All four men were given morphine for pain while surgical teams scrambled to get ready. At around 11 p.m., Frances Flegenheimer returned from her movie to find police in front of the chop house. She thought it was a raid, so she made her way back to New York. She would find out what happened from Dutch in the morning. By the time she got back to Manhattan, the evening edition of the newspaper was on the stand. That's how she learned about the shooting of her husband. But Frances didn't go back to New Jersey. She went home and went to bed. Back in Newark, Charlie the Bug Workman, having been left by Mendy Weiss after the shootout, makes his way to the train tracks and walks along the tracks all the way back to New York. Like I said, the Palace Chop House is a block over from Pennsylvania Station. Now, I wish I had all this information back when I used to stop at Penn Station a lot in my 20s. I knew that Dutch was killed in Newark, but I had no idea that I could just walk over and see the place while I was waiting for my train. It was still standing back then, but it's since been demolished back in 09 or 10, I think. Anyway, meanwhile in Manhattan, while Dutch and his boys were having lead for dessert, Marty Crompier, the third highest paid man in Dutch's organization who was pulling in $1,500 a week during the Depression, was getting ready to go check the fights with his brother Jules and a bookmaking pal of his name, Sammy Gold. But first, Marty wanted to freshen up with a shave at the Hollywood Barbershop, which is next to the Palace Theater at 47th and Broadway. While Dutch was on the run and fighting the law, Marty had become his enforcer in Harlem. George and Bo Weinberg ran the day-to-day, -day, but Marty was in charge of dealing with the black and Cuban dealers when they got out of line. When Marty and his pals came into the barbershop, they may have bumped into Walter Winchell, the well-known reporter and creator of the Gossip Column, who himself had just finished in the chair around 11.30 and headed back to his office. At 12 a.m., 90 minutes after what happened in the chop house, Jules and Sammy Gold were watching the man play pinball as Marty was finishing up in the chair. The barber brushed Marty down and Marty hopped out of the chair ready for the night. The barber pulled the closed sign down on the door and at 12.01, Four hard-faced men burst into the door, one holding a 38. He scanned the room and shots rang out. His first shot went to the ceiling, giving the barber time to get out of the way. The next four were pumped into Marty Crompier. Marty was hit in the chest, the belly, and both arms. Sammy Gold was hit twice by strays. The four hard-faced men turned to the left and made their escape. Marty Crompier crumpled to the floor and said, They got me. When the cops arrived, Marty said, Do something for me. When the cops asked who shot him, he said, I'll sure know if I see him again. When asked was this connected to the shooting in Newark, he said it must be one of those coincidences. Crompier and Gold were taken to the Polyclinic Hospital, where Marty's brother Jules gave blood for a blood transfusion. Back in Newark, the doctors were trying to prevent the city's version of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. But at 2.55 a.m., Otto Berman would be the first one to go, followed by Abe Landau at 6.30 a.m. While Dutch was waiting for surgery, he was given shots of morphine, which we referred to as bonbons. He was alert and talking. By that time, 
the $20 a month doctor who operated on him was on his 16th hour of work and his third surgery of the day. During the 90 minute surgery, he repaired the damages to Dutch's spleen, stomach, colon, and liver. But he missed the wall of the stomach and the gallbladder. But it really wouldn't matter. You see, Charlie the Bug was a professional. The 45 slug that entered Dutch was rusted. But after surgery, it seemed that Dutch might make it. But the rusty bullet caused peritonitis to set in. It caused an infection in the stomach lining, and after a few hours, Dutch was running 106 degree temperature. He asked for his priest to come in. He slipped into a delirium and began to ramble incoherently. At the hospital's front desk, a telegram was delivered, addressed to Dutch. It simply read, As ye sow, so shall ye reap. It was signed by Madame Stephanie St. Clair. Meanwhile, Dutch's mother, sister, and brother-in-law came to his bedside. Frances Flegenheimer showed up at 9.30 the next morning. Police took her into custody. They said that she fit the description of a woman who came to see Dutch at the chop house. At first, she denied being there. But after being identified by the bartender and the cook, she admitted to being there and that she didn't want to be involved. Why should I be mixed up in this thing? Because I'm married to this man, I have to be mixed up with this? Frances Flegenheimer was 21. She married Dutch when she was only 18. Well, it wasn't a real wedding. Dutch had a contract drawn up and the two signed it. She was taken in and she was held as a material witness. Frances had met Dutch when she was working as a hat check girl at the Madison Royal, one of Dutch's late night watering holes. She said it was love at first sight. She was impressed by the way he spoke and his unassuming ways. Three months later, they were signed a contract. Over the next few years, she would bear Dutch two children, a girl named Anna Davis Flegenheimer, she was named after Dixie, and John David Flegenheimer, who was born while Dutch was on trial in Malone. According to Francis, the marriage was a happy one and Dutch was a good husband and loving father. She was grilled for several hours. Detectives felt that she was not showing the proper grief for her husband. They couldn't believe that she went home after finding out about the shooter. The detectives didn't believe her tears and they seemed forced. Francis answered all the questions while fidgeting with a gold charm bracelet that was given to her by Dutch. It was filled with small charms like a wine glass, a whiskey bottle, a head of Christ, and a miniature revolver. Back in Manhattan, Marty Crompier was operated on, the first of many. It was found that one of the bullets was lodged so deep in his intestine that it could not be removed. It seemed as though Marty was a goner, but the doctors at the polyclinic were better than the doctors in North. They performed a miracle. In fact, the surgical team that worked on him received an award from John Hopkins Hospital in D.C. for their work. While Marty Crompier was in between surgeries, the cops pressed him. Tell us who shot you, Marty. I can't. The doctors ordered me not to talk. Sammy Gold's wounds were non-life threatening and he was released in a few days. It would not be until January 1936 that Marty would walk out of the hospital. Early in the morning after the shooting, Charlie the Bug made his way back to Manhattan after walking all night. He went to Lepke fuming and told him that Mendy left him. This was a cardinal sin. You never leave a guy on a hit. Charlie called for Mendy's head and the sit down was arranged. Around 4 p.m., a stenographer was brought in to record the Dutchman's ramblings. For years, people have tried to figure out what the Dutchman was saying. For two hours, on October 24th, F.J. Long, clerk stenographer of the Newark Police Department, took down the Dutchman's last words. What follows is the full transcript the stenographer recorded that day. Has it been in any of the papers? George, don't make no bold moves. What have you done with him? Oh... Mama, mama, mama. Oh, stop it. Stop it. Eh? Oh, oh, sure, sure, mama. Now listen, Phil. Fun is fun. Ah, please. Papa. What happened to the 16? Oh, oh. He done it. Please, John. Please. Oh, did you buy the hotel? You promised a million, sure. Get out. I wish I knew. Please make it quick. Fast and furious. Please, fast and furious. Please help me get out. I'm getting my win back. Thank God. Please, please, oh please. You will have to please tell him. You got no case. You get ahead with the dot dash system. Didn't I speak that last time last night? Whose number is that in your pocketbook? Phil, 13780. Who was it? Oh, please, please. Reserve decision. 
police, police. Henry and Frankie. Oh, 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 dog biscuits. And when he's happy, he doesn't get snappy. Please, please, please do this. Then Henry. Henry, Frankie, did you even meet me? The glove will fit what I say. Oh, Kayiyi, oh Kayiyi. Sure, who cares when you're through? How do you know this? How do you know this? Well then, oh. Coco thinks he's a grandpa again. He's jumping around. No hobo fobo. I think this means the same thing. Detectives used this time to question Dutch and see if they could get any info out of him. Homicide detective Luke Conlon pulled a chair next to his bed and began to ask them questions. Who shot you? The boss himself. He did? Yes, I don't know. What'd he shoot you for? I showed him boss. Did you hear me? An appointment. Appeal stuck. All right, all right, mother. Was it the boss who shot you? Who shot me? No one. We will help you. Will you help me up? Okay, I won't be such a big creep. Oh, mama, I can't go through with it. Please. Oh, and then he clips me. Come on, cut that out. We don't owe a nickel. Hold it against him. I'm a pretty good pretzler. Winifred, Department of Justice. I even got it from the department. Sir, please stop it. Listen to last night. Sergeant Conlon told him not to holler. I don't want to holler. What'd they shoot you for? I don't know, sir. Honestly, I don't know. I don't even know who was with me. Honestly, I was in the toilet, and when I reached the... The boy came at me. The big fellow gave it to you? Yes, he gave it to me. Do you know who this big fellow was? No. If he wanted to break the ring, no. Please get a month. They did it. Come on. Cuts me off and says you're not to be the beneficiary of his will. Is that right? I will be checked and double checked and please pull for me. Will you pull? How many good ones and how many bad ones? Please, I had nothing with him. He was a cowboy in one of the seven day a week fights. No business, no hangout, no friends, nothing. Just what you pick up and what you need. I don't know who shot me. Don't put anyone near this check. You might have. Please do it for me. Let me get up, huh? In the olden days, they waited and they waited. Please give me a shot. This was from the factory. Sure, that is a bad. Well, oh good. Go ahead, that's what happens for trying. I don't want harmony. I want harmony. Oh, mama, mama. Who give it to him? Let me in the district, fire factory, that he was nowhere near. It smoldered. No, no. There were only 10 of us, and there are 10 million fighting somewhere of you. So get your onions up, and we'll throw up a truce flag. Oh, please, let me up. Please shift me. Police are here. Communistic. Strike. Baloney. Honestly, this is a habit. I get it. Sometimes I give it, and sometimes I don't. Oh, I am all in. That settles it. Are you sure? Please let me get in and eat. Let him harass himself to you and then bother you. Please don't ask me to go there. I don't want to. I still don't want him in my path. It's no use to stage a riot. The sidewalk was in trouble and the bears were in trouble and I broke it up. Please put me in that room. Please keep him in control. My guilt edged stuff and those dirty rats have tuned in. Please mother, don't tear, don't rip. That is something that shouldn't be spoken about. Please get me up. My friends, please look out. The shooting is a bit wild and that kind of shooting saved the man's life. No payrolls, no wells, no coupons. That will be entirely out. Pardon me, I forgot that I was a plaintiff and not a defendant. Look out for him, please. He owed me the money. He owes everybody money. But why can't he just pull out and give me control? Please, mother, you pick me up now. Please, you know me. No, don't you scare me. My friends and I think that I'd do a better job. Police are looking for you all over. Be instrumental in letting us know. They are Englishmen, 
and they are a type. I don't know who's the best. They are us. Oh, sir, get the dollar roofing. Can you play jacks? And girls do that with a softball and do tricks with it. I take all events into consideration. No, no, and it's no. It's confused and it says no. A boy has never wept nor dashed a thousand kim. Did you hear me? The detective asked him again, who shot you? I don't know. How many shots were fired? I don't know. How many? 2,000, come one. Get some money in the treasury, we need it. Come on, please get it. I can't tell you to. That's not what you have in the book. Oh, please warden. What am I doing for money? Please put me up on my feet at once. You're a hard boiled man. Did you hear me? I would hear it. The circuit court would hear it. And the Supreme Court might hear it. If that ain't the payoff, please crack down on the Chinaman's friends and Hitler's commander. I'm sore and I'm going up and I'm going to give to you, honey, if I can. Mother is the best bet and don't let Satan draw you too fast. The detective asked him again, what did the big fella shoot you for? Him? John? Over a million. Five million dollars. You want to get well, don't you? Yes. Then lie quiet. Yes, I will lie quiet. The detective said, John shot and we'll take care of John. That is what caused the trouble. Look out. Please let me up. If you do this, you can go on and jump right here in the lake. I know who they are. They're French people. All right. Look out. Look out. Oh, my memory is gone. A work relief police. Who gets it? I don't know and I don't want to know. But look out. It can be traced. He's changed for the worst. My fortunes have changed and come back and went back since then. It was desperate. I'm wobbly. You ain't got nothing on him, but you got it on his helper. The detective said, control yourself. But I'm dying. No, you're not. Come on, mama. All right. Dear, you have to get it. At this time, Francis was brought into the room and she whispered into his ear. This is Francis. Dutch started rambling again. Then pulled me out. I'm half crazy. They won't let me get up. They dyed my shoes. Open those shoes. Give me something. I'm so sick. Give me some water, the only thing that I want. Open this up and break it so I can touch you. Danny, please get me in the car. Francis left the room and Sergeant Conlon continued to question Dutch. Who shot you? I don't know. I didn't even get a look. I don't know. Who could have done it? Anybody. Kindly take my shoes off. He was told that they were off. No, there's a handcuff on him. The Baron says these things. I know what I'm doing here with my collection of papers. It isn't worth a nickel to two guys like you and me, but to a collector it's worth a fortune. It's priceless. I'm going to turn it over too. Turn you back to me. Please, Henry. I'm so sick now. The police are getting many complaints. Look out. I want that G-note. Look out for Jimmy Valentine, for he's an old pal of mine. Come on, come on, Jim. Okay, okay. I'm all through. I can't do another thing. Look out, mama. Look out for her. You can't beat him. Police, mama, Helen, mother, please take me out. I will settle the indictment. Come on, open up the soap ducats. The chimney sweeps. Talk to the sword. Shut up. You gotta be a big mouth. Please help me up. Henry, Max, come over here. French Canadian bean soup. I wanna pay. Let them leave me alone. At 6 p.m., Dutch fell into a coma. The stenographer and the police left. Only the surgeon and nurses remained. At 8.20, the doctor sent for Francis to say her goodbyes. She whispered in the ear, Arthur is Francis, but there was no response. She left the room crying. 15 minutes later, Dutch mumbled something. The nurse thought he was asking for water, but by the time she turned around with the water, the doctor looked up and said, it's over. At 8.20 p.m., October 24th, 1935, Dutch show slipped into legend. Now Francis said that Dutch was a good husband. He may have been, he may have been too good because that next afternoon, a tall blonde came into the hospital and said that she was Mrs. Arthur Fleckenheimer and she would like to see her husband's remains. She was taken to the morgue, and when the sheet was pulled back, her knees buckled. After a drink of water, she recovered and asked to see the Dutchman's effects, 
his gold watch and sapphire ring. She was told that they had been confiscated by the police and she would have to wait. She said, how long? The tall blonde then got into a hearse and accompanied Dutch's corpse to the funeral home. When the police searched Dutch's hotel, they found letters addressed from mommy to poppy. One of those notes said, oh poppy, I'm so lonesome for you. Wish I could come east and join you. We're looking forward to a reunion. The note was accompanied by a picture of Dutch with a woman who was not Francis and two children that were not Anna and John. When this picture was shown to Francis, she had no idea who the woman was. It seems that the Dutchman had a wife and kids out in Chicago. Not much is known about this woman, but it is said that her name was Anna, which also happens to be his daughter's name with Francis. That's not creepy at all. And it was thought that Dutch had left a million dollars in a Boston bank account in her name. But as for Francis, there was no bank account. Six weeks later, another woman walked into the hospital claiming to be Mrs. Arthur Fleckenheimer. She looked to be 10 years older than the blonde bombshell who accompanied Dutch. The clerk informed her that another woman said that she was Dutch's wife. She said that that must be his lady friend. I happen to be Mrs. Fleckenheimer. And when asked for proof, she produced a legal document. After inspection, she was told that all of Dutch's things were confiscated by the police. At 3 a.m. that next morning, Lulu Rosencrantz joined his pals. Dutch Schultz did not receive the funeral worthy of his status. He was placed in a simple chestnut coffin and was buried without fanfare in the Gates of Heaven Cemetery in Hawthorne, Westchester County. He was given a Catholic mass, but his mother placed a Jewish shawl over the casket before it was lowered into the ground. Even in death, the government still hounded Dutch. As his family was leaving the funeral, two agents, one of them from the state of New York and one federal, handed Francis papers ordering her to turn over Dutch's records. The government had a lien on Dutch for $115,000, and the state wanted another seventy dollars Francis threw the papers to the ground and smacked one of the agents with a handbag. And that, my friends, is the story of Dutch Schultz. I hope you enjoyed the story as much as I enjoyed telling it. If you want the uncut versions of this video and other videos, and if you want to get the videos early, you have to join the Few Bad Men Patreon channel. All right. If you're new here and you like what we do over here at A Few Bad Men, you want to join the gang, you got to bump off that subscribe button. That's your first thing. Then you got to break that thumb. Then you got to ring that bell and set it for all of notifications. And if you want to slide an envelope upstairs to the boss to help the channel run smooth, the link is in the description. Okay? So stay tuned. I'm going to be doing some follow-up videos on some of the characters from the Dutch Show story. You know, just to fill in the blanks like I like to do. I can't get everything into the stories and, and make the story flow nice. So, this has been A Few Bad Men. Keep your nose clean and don't take any wooden nickels. I see you in the funnies.